Good afternoon. My name is Aaron Carey from Wellsburg, West Virginia, up in Brooke County. And uh, I'd like to welcome you to the August 2020 edition of the Little Lectures from the West Virginia Humanities Council. It's an honor to be down here. We were originally supposed to be set up in March down here, and uh, due to the shutdown, we've had to postpone to August. So I'm really happy to finally make it down here. Uh, a little bit of my background, uh, I grew up playing the guitar from the age of 10 and uh, throughout high school played and when it came time to go to college I went to West Virginia University and decided to pursue guitar studies there mainly in classical guitar. I was the president of the West Virginia University Chamber Guitar Ensemble for several years and uh, when I moved back to Brook County in 2001, I continued teaching there. And uh, I've been in several studios throughout the, the tri-state area. And um, in 2005, I joined the faculty at Bethany College as uh, a lecturer in music, teaching guitar classes there. And I've, I'm about to begin my 15th year out there. So throughout my training, uh, I've, I've been involved in several different genres of music. I mainly grew up on heavy metal. That was, uh, that was my thing in, in school is what I connected to. And I took that uh, uh, interest into, into uh, my adult life, but also with classical guitar as a, a main focus, classical music, and uh, occasionally being uh, involved with jazz and country music and bluegrass and, and several other styles, but it was always metal that I came back to. So I came here today to talk about metal and uh, in particular a genre called black metal and uh, the role that bands and artists in this region have with that genre and how, how they're interconnected. So. Where did this all start? I'm going back way before black metal was a, a thing. Link Ray was a Shawnee guitarist and uh, he, he shook a lot of things up in uh, 1958 with the single Rumble, which uh, a lot of you have probably heard that song, but at the time it was very far ahead of its time and uh, very, uh, scary to a lot of people and it was basically like two gangs coming together to fight. I like to come back to Link's music from time to time even though it's not exactly what we would consider heavy metal today. It definitely laid a groundwork for it. Link was uh, a pioneer of several things related to metal such as distortion. It had existed a, a bit before that. The uh, distorted sound of the guitars that we hear in rock and metal. But Link would actually stab his speakers with pencils to make them rattle more. And uh, when people first heard that, you know, at the time, extreme distortion that they'd never heard before, it really made their ears perk up. So Link also pioneered the use of the power chord. And for you um, in the audience that study music, it's just the harmonized root, a root note and a fifth above. And there's no third in the chord to tell you whether it's major or minor. And uh, that sound became the, the backbone of our rock, punk, metal, hard rock, and so on. He also, as far as I know, invented the pick scrape or the pick slide, the abrasive sound of a guitar pick going along the windings of the strings that we still hear now. All the way back in 1958. Now let's fast forward a little bit to the band Coven. 1969, the album Witchcraft Destroys Minds and Reaps Souls was definitely an eye-opener. Uh, this is very far ahead of its time and extreme for the time. Uh, didn't catch on quite so much. Uh, this was happening at the same time of the Charles Manson murders, etc. And uh, the overt satanic themes were, were pretty shocking to mainstream America. But it definitely laid uh, a path for 
later bands uh, into the occult. I wouldn't call this heavy metal. Uh, I would say that, call it psychedelic rock, acid rock, something of that sort. But the significance of this, the first of the horns that you see on stage, the sign of the horns, uh, so you can see the members of the bam band are wearing inverted crosses. Uh, first use, of, as far as I know, the term Hail Satan on, on a recording. Not just dark themes, but on the gatefold, the, the singer was nude in a black mass. Very shocking for the time, and I'm sure there were a lot of parents throwing that record out. While not as raw and heavy sounding as uh, some of the later bands, this album definitely said, wow, look what you can do with music as far as the occult is involved. Just a few months later, self-titled Black Sabbath record across the ocean in Birmingham, England. There are some strange coincidences with this, such as Ozzy Osbourne was the singer for Black Sabbath at the time, and Coven had a singer, or a, I'm sorry, had a, a band member named Oz Osbourne. And uh, they both had a track named Black Sabbath as the first song on the album. But Black Sabbath is generally considered the first true heavy metal band, and true heavy metal album. There are definitely some honorable mentions. Iron Butterfly, Blue Cheer, and so on. There are several other bands that paved the way for that. But Black Sabbath had a genuinely... Uh, Genuine evil vibe, at least on that opening track. The use of the tritone, the halfway point of the octave, is a very creepy interval to have in music that, uh, as far as I know, was at some point banned in the, in the Middle Ages as summoning the devil or something. Um, a very evil atmosphere, as well as the thunderstorm sounds and the bells, or dark atmosphere uh, from, from the very beginning of that album. That whole album was recorded in live sessions in one day and created the, the birth of heavy metal as we know it. We also see references to Lucifer, to Tolkien, and H.P. Lovecraft in this album. So, so we could go on and on about heavy metal's evolution. That would be a different talk altogether. Over the decade of the 70s, we had bands developed like Judas Priest, Led Zeppelin, uh, into Iron Maiden and such. And these heavier genres started to, to branch off. Well, one of these branches was what we now call black metal. And I've picked out a few bands here. Venom from England, Hellhammer, which became Celtic Frost from Switzerland, Merciful Fate from Denmark, and Bathory from Sweden. There are others, but these are just the four that I'll focus on here. I'm going to start with Venom here. This is very early on. The album I've picked to, to show here is from 1982, and it's called Black Metal. So we see the, the naming of a genre here. And when I was growing up listening to various styles of metal bands, or various types of, of bands, I didn't really notice a different a difference stylistically uh, from band to band when, when it came to the occult bands that people were referring to as, as black metal. They may have, may have had a little more raw or evil sounding uh, approach, but generally, musically, they were similar to a lot of bands that sang about history or uh, art or wars, things like that. So. Venom was a little different. One, something that became uh, very prominent in black metal later on was that they took away their God-given names and had stage names, which might, a lot of these bands that used them had demonic sounding names or mythological sounding names. Uh, and all, although not the first with the leather and the spikes, uh, the, the stage clothes, you know, you have bands like Kiss that had a, a really wild stage show, too. But uh, bands like Venom took this another step. It's generally considered that Venom did a lot of these satanic themes for shock value, but it was very influential for the genre. Here we see a picture of Venom in 1984 
with some pretty extreme outfits and swords and skulls and such. Okay, this brings us to Hellhammer. And Hellhammer up the speed and the intensity of the music a little bit and uh, is generally uh, lumped in with the, the genre known as thrash early in the early 80s. I uh, picked out the Satanic Rites demo here, which definitely starts to uh, incorporate true occult themes into metal in a more intense way than a lot of bands have. And you have songs like uh, Triumph of Death, Revelations of Doom, Decapitator, Blood Insanity, Power of Satan. This stuff was very in your face. <laughs> Music for the time and uh, infectious, almost punk-like uh, approach, but with a, a lot more extremity to the music. This band became Celtic Frost later, who threw in a lot of different elements and pushed the envelope of what you could do with the genre. Not always fast, some of this music was a lot slower, and they also incorporated some goth elements into their music, especially on this album that came after, Into the Pandemonium. Very polarizing record, but at the same time mixed in elements of, of goth, ambient, atmospheric music that uh, would be influential later on. That brings me to this one, Merciful Fate. Merciful Fate was a, a band that, well, still is a band, but this was the one band that I thought of as, oh, okay, that's what that black metal thing is. And it wasn't that they were super different musically than other heavy metal bands at the time. Uh, they did have a little more of an evil sound, or I should say a lot more of an evil sound in, in the choice of the melodies that they used, and definitely in the themes of the song. In the debut here, Melissa, you have songs like Evil, Curse of the Pharaohs, At the Sound of the Demon Bell, Black Funeral, Satan's Fall. And these songs sound genuinely evil, and the, their band leader, King Diamond, is the, the real deal as far as knowing the occult and being involved in it. I prefer this one. It's my favorite from them, and same with a lot of people. Okay, Come to the Sabbath, Night of the Unborn, Desecration of Souls. These are classics, and some of the most classic artwork, too, you know? And when I was seeing these albums growing up, I thought, I don't know if I should be listening to this. I think a lot of people probably thought this, too. Like, ah, that's taboo. It's cool. I want to check it out. But at the same time, am I harming myself by listening to it? rather than just enjoying it like I do now. So I think a lot of people grew up that way. So at this point, I've been talking about bands that I consider to be heavy metal bands about the occult. It's like, well, what do we call those? And back then, this black metal term seemed to, uh, seemed to stick because it set their uh, music apart thematically from the bands who were singing about something else or writing songs about something else. But at some point, late 80s, early 90s, like a true black metal genre started to form based on its sound as well. So I have a few bands here that we can look at. Bathory was very important in, in several different ways. One is the, the establishment of the one-man band. And you even hear people talk about bedroom black metal projects, basement black metal projects. It's just, uh, you know, it could be a very serious thing to somebody. It could be a, a side hobby that they do in their free time. They write music that they're influenced by other bands and form their own one-person project. You don't have to rely on anyone else. And now we have plenty of accessible... Uh, recording things right on our phone, for example, that we can make albums with. It kind of started with Quarth and from Bathory. So here I have the, the self-titled with the, the goat head is, you know, very, very striking album cover and uh, kind of shows you what you can expect from it. And uh, then I picked a later album, Hammerheart, because uh, his style had started to shift a little bit into a more epic territory and helped with the establishment of the Viking metal genre as well. 
which is another culture, cultural heritage based uh, metal subgenre. Then, as far as furthering this, this sound that was uh, influenced by Bathory, you have some classics of Norwegian black metal. And this is probably nowadays what you hear the most about. There have been a lot of books, documentaries, and such about the, uh, the early 90s second wave of black metal in, in Norway. And I, we could go on all day talking about this movement and these bands and what happened with them. But the, the three that I picked out are Mayhem, Dark Throne, and Emperor. If you're unfamiliar with Mayhem, that's something that uh, you'll, you'll have to look up. There was a lot of controversies with uh, murder a recent movie that came out based on this. But musically, extremely influential as far as the establishment of an actual sound that we think of as modern black metal on this De Mysterious Dom Satanas album. And then uh, Dark Throne as well. Dark Throne, this is my favorite, Under a Funeral Moon. And when I first heard it, I wasn't too into it. A very raw sound that, uh, that grew on me over time. I knew Dark Throne from uh, their earlier work, which was death metal. That's a, a separate genre of metal that is uh, usually lower pitched growling singing, uh, quick tremolo picked guitar uh, in lower tunings, and uh, more macabre topics uh, dealing with death and war and uh, depression, so on. Not that those can't happen in black metal, they do. But black metal usually has a, a higher pitched uh, guitar sound, higher pitched screeching vocals, and uh, preoccupation with uh, Satanism and the occult. Emperor, my first taste of that, wow, this is a really raw recording. It sounds like it wasn't recorded very well. I can't tell what's going on with the guitars. So my initial reaction was I didn't like it very much. And uh, the, the charm of it grew on me later. And I came to realize with this album, in the Nightside Eclipse, as well as the successor to this, uh, that they had some extremely sophisticated, for their age, uh, amazing, epic, complicated, deep music. And uh, as a friend of mine, Marty Ritkinen from Bind Rune Recordings, I grew up reading his uh, his articles in, in Metal Maniacs and his reviews of different bands. And then we became friends later. He would all, always call bands world building. And I, I like that. I like that term that you can listen to a band and close your eyes and it takes you to a different world that you didn't know existed. All right, so this brings me to uh, my, my, main, my main focus here is how does this relate to the Appalachian region? How does this relate to West Virginia and uh, Kentucky and Tennessee and such? How, how is it interpreted in different parts of this region? There are a lot of different areas in, in, across the world that have developed their own particular sound being influenced by the types of records that I just showed. Uh, for me, possibly the, the most influential sound or uh, scene was from Norway as I was talking, but it was some of the slightly later bands like this one, Ulver, uh, they used their folklore from Norway. And I really could relate to that. I love the music. This is, as far as black metal, this is basically a perfect album and even mixes in clean vocals, atmosphere, beautiful guitar work, um, as well as some of the more nasty sounding raw black metal, all, all in one. And I love that they were influenced by their own place, their own heritage, and, uh, but didn't make a cartoon of it either. It's very genuine, very pure, wonderful stuff. Their second album was a real eye-opener for me because it's all acoustic. It's all classical music, all classical guitar, uh, a cappella vocals and such. And I thought, wow, you can do that. Other scenes developed in Greece, 
the Northwest of the U.S., the Cascadian sound, uh, Finnish black metal, Swedish black metal, in general a little more melodic than the Norwegian stuff. You can look all over the world and you'll find scenes. But I want to talk about this region here. So when I was thinking about this, I was like, I, you know, I, I never really came to a conclusion. I just do what I do and listen to other artists in, in the region and, and think, I, well, I never really thought, do we have a scene, a sound? We're kind of rural. We don't get together that much, but we talk online and stuff to each other. We don't have big urban areas besides Pittsburgh, where I live. So I asked some friends, fans, uh, people from labels, people from bands and such, what their opinions are on that uh, to get a perspective on this because I don't have a whole lot of info to go from. This isn't a real well documented thing, I don't think. So I asked them, what sets bands apart uh, in this region from, from other regions? What, what do you think would, would be some differences or characteristics? And here's what I got. Uh, telling stories of our area and our histories, occasional use of traditional instruments, uh, originality, obvious passion for their instruments, acknowledge of local native heritage rather than a focus on Satanism. Uh, that's to say that bands don't set out to have an evil image, rather their tone is set through the music. The album art often conveys the beauty of the area, even if the music itself is harsh and extreme. That's in contrast to some of the record co uh, album covers we were just looking at here. Investment in history and local or regional culture in the lyrical content and musical approach in a living and current way. Not a cartoonization, living history being passed down from generation to generation and blended into the music. This response was a little, a little longer and more in-depth, but I like it. I, th I think that it's a really, really good point. Uh, the Norwegian black metal scene that we were just talking about here had a, a misanthropic attitude towards society. And as you see, if you look into this, there was church burnings, murders, things that I never would have thought about when I was 16 to, to do. I never would have had that desire. But that, those were things that were happening over there and uh, in, embedded in this black metal scene. Uh, I'm sorry, I'll backtrack here. Had a misanthropic attitude towards society, the self, and embracing ag aggression and chaos as Satan over tranquility and order, which is God. Over time, artists incorporated other sounds, industrial, symphonic, ambient, progressive sounds to their style, but their themes didn't necessarily change. Even when they threw in uh, Viking history, Nordic history and such, and mythology, it's usually antithetical to tranquility and order. Whereas uh, bands from Appalachia generally focus on man's chaotic relationship with order and tranquility of nature. Instead of using industrial or symphonic elements, some bands incorporate music familiar to the region, such as folk and bluegrass, uh, to give the, the music an element of authenticity. I would say, in my case, uh, the use of Algonquin syllables and, and Native American flute as well. So I add my own opinion to this as well, is that a lot of these projects use place names that, that are special. I use this in my music a lot, and I'm definitely not the only one. Uh, I also like to use the original names of places, not just uh, French or English names that were given later, or necessarily the, the Anglic uh, Anglicization of Indian names. Uh, this isn't exactly original or unique. Uh, enslaved had uh, Hordain's land. Uh, the Uver we were just talking about here uh, had their local lore. Uh, Nagora Bungat from Romania had an interconnected interconnectedness with Transylvania and uh, with the nature of their place. Um, geography and isolation play a bigger role in the lyrics and the approach and the art and the atmosphere of the music. Uh, of course, we're not the first people to do this. So 
places that might have been unknown, uh, like uh, Mingo Run, for example, is something that people aren't going to know worldwide. It's a place uh, next to my granddad's house. <laughs> this creek like this wide. <laughs> yeah. So uh, now people in other parts of the world know about these places, and uh, that, that makes me feel pretty good to be able to, to write about them and do honor to these places that are special to me. Um, a lot of these artists are, are a little less misanthropic and uh, more inclined to be against social injustice, uh, poverty and corporate greed, pollution, than they would be to be against religion or something. Okay, maybe a little more politically aware. Uh, mainly because um, there are already bands, so many, so many bands that, that cover this topic of evil and darkness and Satanism. And that's, hey, that's art. That's, you write what you want to, uh, want to write about in your music. But since so many bands already do this, it's like, hey, I, I'm influenced by this band in Finland talking about Karelia. What's that? What's the history of that place? I'm going to look it up. That sounds interesting because a band that I like is, is writing an entire album about that. So it must be significant. Why don't I do that here? Why don't I write about my county that I grew up in? Because we have some crazy stories. And uh, we have some uh, uh, 16,000 years of Indian history that people don't talk about very often. I want to write some albums about that. Who's speaking up for where we live? Who's speaking up for the problems that we have in, in music? Um, so those are my thoughts on what might influence artists to, uh, to write about this region and, and why black metal might be a good way to, uh, a good home for that as opposed to pop or country. I haven't heard any country songs about Indians, archaic Indians in the Ohio Valley 8,000 years ago. So uh, I, I have to say, too, that many times I thought that black metal is not really the correct term for the music that I'm, talking, that I'm about to talk about here. I think that a lot of these uh, bands might, might be better called folk metal because they use folk, uh, uh, folk heritage, folk music and, and such, and uh, there's not much focus on Satanism and there's definitely a focus on problems and darkness and uh, maybe what we could term evil, but evil in, in man and corporate entities rather than evil in, in a biblical sense or religious sense. It's become kind of a catch-all term for a specific sound. And that, to me, is the, the big question. Are you referring to the sound or are you referring to the content? What's black about it? So that brings me to, well, look, we have Appalachia here, which is a bigger region than I realized. I'd never actually seen a defined map of Appalachia, and I always thought of it as that skinny part of the map where the mountains actually are and not all the foothills and everything. So I'm trying to stick within this region for projects here that I'm talking about. All right, so some relevant works here. This, uh, I believe this is a one-man project, one or two, uh, just not too many people involved with this. I think one main songwriter from Shellsburg, uh, out near Shawnee Lake, Johnstown, Altoona area. And this music sounds like a lot of symphonic uh, European black metal bands that I've listened to, uh, such as Ancient or uh, Flowers or, or something. Uh, really good, interesting stuff. Great approach, but also there's this mix of folk music of our region mixed in with it. And I like this guy's approach because I think it's similar to what I'm doing with my own music. He's taking very local themes and making music about it, making people aware of this. So we have songs titled such as Keystone, Great Flood of 1889, Death of the Last Wolf, you can see on this album cover here, built 1806, I think it says, on this log cabin. I have a log cabin that looks just like that in, in the town where I live. And uh, I can relate to it. But maybe other people would see this and be able to relate to a place that they'd never even visited. 
You can see a contrast too in these album covers. This Raven Forest EP and Winter Always Returns. The Raven Forest EP has a, a bird and a mountainscape. And this looks a lot different than something like this. A lot different approach. Focuses often on the beauty of the area. It's just a stylistic thing. Um, we also have Twilight Fauna. Twilight Fauna from Johnson, Johnson City, Tennessee. And uh, I've met the guy that writes this music several times. And uh, calls it folk metal, a folk metal band devoted to telling the stories of Appalachia. And he definitely does that. Especially on the early releases, there's a lot of raw material, very raw black metal uh, that's refined over the years and had more elements mixed into it. Um, recently, as much as adding in a full string band on some of this music, folk instruments here and there, but sometimes a full bluegrass mountain, mountain band going on on the albums. So I asked him, what, what why did you start doing this in the first place? And he said that uh, growing up, he had a love of both old time music and metal, and he decided to pursue both at the same time. So why not do that to you know, express your, your feelings about the dark and light stories of your region of Appalachia? All right, I have to mention this band because they were such a huge influence on me. Uh, me, Goss. Definitely not a black metal band, but similar. More death metal, more gruff approach, I guess, as far as, uh, it's really hard to describe <laughs> verbally the differences between these genres without actually hear them, hearing them. So some guys traversing some hills in the Laurel Highlands of Pennsylvania. It's my friend Chris out in front here, Chris Allen or Andaqua, has been my mentor for all things Indian since 1992. A friend of mine and my first band I ever played in, he said, you should, you should write this guy. He's, he's an Indian. He plays drums and he likes death metal. You should write to him. So we've been friends ever since then, nine, 1992. And I, I've never met somebody so knowledgeable about our area, about Indian history, about uh, religions of all types. And also, this is significant for my own writing because they called it Algonquin War Metal. All right? So Algonquin themes are not very common in most of the bands that I hear of any, any genre. And uh, that's my background on, on my mom's side, Shawnee and Lenape heritage. And I always wanted to know more about that growing up. And this, uh, my visits with this group uh, and their tribal group the Loyal Hannah, Sewickley, Shawnee, Lenape, and Cherokee descendants. Um, I learned a lot about what I currently write about. And the first, user, first instance I've seen of songs in both English and Shawnee, which is something that I've continued in my music. Also, we talk about bands you know, that might be writing about log cabins and settlers and, or just uh, folk music heritage in, in general, but they were the only band that I knew of that sang in really specific history about uh, prehistory in, in West Virginia and Pennsylvania, the Ohio Valley and such. And that was very in, influential on me of like, wow, you can, you can actually make this work with music. Next we have uh, Ulf, Ulfren, which was a, a new one to me. Uh, originally from Gasway, West Virginia, and relocated to Atlanta, according to what I found. It's pagan atmospheric black metal, like a lot of bands from the US and from Europe. Uh, I was struck by how well he incorporated the, the traditional music and, and especially the folk singing. It was very haunting. It was like something you would see on a PBS documentary or something like that. But, and I'm saying that in a complimentary way that it fit in with black metal like really well. And I never would have thought of doing that. That was impressive to me. According to Vice Magazine here is a nice quote 
speaks to West Virginia's current moment, devastated by widespread opioid abuse, exploited by big business, lied to by politicians, and yet still overwhelmingly, enduringly beautiful. That's the atmosphere we're looking at. If I can't describe the actual sound of music, this describes the theme of it very well. And this interview with uh, the songwriter Dalton Miller, who writes this all friend music, I try to express the rebellious sort of ugly side of this place while still maintaining it has its own beauty. This next uh, project was somewhat new to me uh, as well, Vials of Wrath, very unique approach here in that this is a, a Christian metal project, as far as I know, with ties to Southern West Virginia. I'm not sure which town. Uh, described on their Bandcamp page as a nature-inspired metal intent on evoking solitude with an affinity for the divine. Definitely a, a unique approach. Christian black metal. Um, it's not the, not the first project I've heard of that takes that approach. So everyone is uh, free to make their, their own art the way that they see fit. But as far as calling it black metal and being Christian, I don't know. There's a very polarizing topic. Torrid Husk. Torrid Husk is uh, from throughout West Virginia. And uh, I was in contact with these guys for a while and haven't heard anything from them recently. I don't know if they're still active. And uh, I'll talk more about them here shortly. But I thought they were significant. Uh, for, for one, I would musically consider them absolutely black metal, uh, on par with any of the European bands. Technically proficient and uh, really fantastic songwriting. Exceptional. And I don't know why they didn't get bigger. And uh, maybe they don't want to. Maybe that's part of the underground ethic of it. But the regional uh, references we have in here, like Mingo, the Mingo Confederation of Indians, and we also have a Mingo County in West Virginia. Uh, Rhododendron, Mate Juan, references in this music. I thought that was really, really just awesome to see that from a band of, as extreme as they are. One last one here, besides my own music, is Panopticon. And uh, I was really on the fence about this because uh, the, the main songwriter is, is a good friend of mine. And he said, I, I'm not Appalachian. I never lived there. I never grew up. So I have to throw that out there that he does not consider himself Appalachian. But the music of this region, the, the folk traditional music, uh, is, it permeates his music as well as outlaw country music that he writes. Is, is really amazing stuff. So I brought this record. I think this one is, well, this one's very well known to people that are into this genre. But if you're unfamiliar with it, the album's called Kentucky. And it's a dedication to the, the whole state of Kentucky, not just the Appalachian region. So I think a lot of his uh, upbringing was in Louisville. This has songs like uh, Come All Ye Coal Miners, Which Side Are You On? Killing the Giants as They Sleep, Black Waters, and, and Kentucky. Um, some of the proceeds from this record were, were used to fight against mountaintop removal. And it's good to put your money where your mouth is with this stuff. This was a very significant, uh, the, the beginning of a very significant trilogy. Kentucky, uh, Roads to the North, and Autumn Eternal that he wrote. And throughout, well, it's, it's about his moving from Kentucky to the North Woods above uh, Minnesota, or above Minneapolis, Minnesota, to start a new life with his family. So the themes in this are very close to the uh, Appalachian region and the Dobros, vi uh, fiddles, banjos, and such that are incorporated into the music give a lot of people what they consider an, an Appalachian bluegrass black grass, I guess they would call it, sound to it. So very, uh, very relevant to the topic, if not within the re region itself. Now I'd like to talk about some of my own music that I've done in this genre and uh, try to explain how 
these records I've been talking about have, have influenced me or where that's gone for me. And the first thing I have is the very beginning here. And then, and then I have some more recent records I've been a part of. It's Dethrone, Dark Rebirth demo tape. I, I did not appear on this. I was not on this album. But I heard it when I was 15, when I was just getting into brutal death metal bands like Suffocation and Morbid Angel and Incantation and Deicide and Nocturnus and so on. This was a good slab of death metal from five minutes from my house, and I couldn't believe it. Wow, there's guys that not only can play that stuff or do play that, but they write their own songs. And they got it together enough to have a tape with the artwork. And I was just blown away. Well, they wanted another guitarist, so I auditioned for the band, and, and I got in the band. And it led to my first shows. And... Uh, the drummer was kind of the, the leader, decision maker of this band, and quickly went the route that Dark Throne did and said, I'm totally into this Norwegian black metal. I want to try to play that style. So this band also became the first band in my region that I knew of that played the black metal stuff, the Norwegian-inspired black metal. So in 93, we recorded the Black Moon Hymns demo, which I don't think ever got released, and I may have the only copy of it. There were a lot of mistakes on that, on that record, but there was a lot of really uh, interesting stuff on it, too. But it was my first attempt to, to write this black metal style music, and uh, I had a good chemistry with that band at the time, so uh, things came out pretty well. But it was also my first attempt to write music on acoustic guitar that was atmospheric and uh, using a Native American flute as well. It's the first time I ever put that, that stuff together. Um, I was also going by the name Nachachwan at the time uh, it, in music projects like this. Uh, it's a Lenape term uh, that means walks alone. And I continue to use that to this day for my main project. We are standing in uh, Cross Creek uh, Wildlife Management Area in Brook County under a waterfall there. And on the left is Andrew DeCagna, a great friend of mine that I do almost all of my music with and have been recording with since 2002. And uh, he goes by the name Pahonison in Nechachwan, which means drummer. He plays bass and drums and does 98% of the engineering that we, uh, for our music. S means walks alone in the Lenape language. And I call this Appalachian folk metal. It's the older use of the term Appalachia. And to be honest, I'm not sure if that's a Hitchiti word, Yuki, or what. I think it's pre-Algonquin. Appalachian. But I prefer the term folk metal over black metal because we don't have any satanic themes or cult themes or anything like that and, and never have and, and I think that should be reserved for the bands that do. Uh, here is some of the symbolism that we use. On the left we have our old logo and this design has the turtle at the top. It's based off of a stone turtle tablet that was found in a mound in the northern panhandle. Uh, two symmetrical phases of the moon signifying time, passage of time, and underneath uh, flames of a fire, the fire of your hearth and your home place. On the right we have uh, a newer design. We have our newer logo that uh, I designed the rough idea of it and uh, Austin Lund from Panopticon uh, realized it for us artistically with the, the trees growing off of, of it and uh, the O and the C create a fish. A big part of our heritage is fishing. We have these monito uh, symmetrical characters that were carved into uh, the door of a Lenape house some 500 years ago in eastern Pennsylvania near Philadelphia as well as uh, 
mound builder or Mississippian era uh, cutout of copper or mica. I can't remember. Down below, we have uh, some stacked elements into a design. We have uh, a Mississippian shell disc on the lower layer, followed by the oak leaves of the Shawnee, uh, a mound builder skull from an archaeological book, the 1800s, and a, uh, an atlatl spear dart. Not very common things to see on a shirt, I would say, nowadays. Uh, this is how this came to be. I, I'd used this name, Nechachwan, for, for years uh, in, in various projects, usually as a guest spot doing classical guitar or something like that. But uh, I was approached in 2005 or so by a, a true black metal label in Fort Wayne, Indiana called Dark Horizon Records who had heard some of my classical and acoustic work and said, if you did a whole album of that stuff, we would love to put that out. So I said, ah, okay, that sounds like a good challenge. So I started putting it together and the, the music was uh, you know, somber, but really relaxing classical and acoustic guitar stuff, with a lot of slide guitars and such, and uh, keyboard work. And this is the album that came out, Algonquian Mythos, and it was somewhat a, a diversion from metal at the time for me. So what I had attempted to do was I was very influenced growing up by uh, the Alan Eckert books, the Narratives of America, and so on, uh, other historical books, anything with, with uh, ties to this region in the past. And I thought, I'd love to write a book by, like that, but I don't think that's my thing. So I'm going to write like chapters of a book where you imagine what's going on in the music. I don't know if that's a good idea or a bad idea, but it, it made sense at the time. Uh, soundscapes basically, because there's very few words on this whole album. But there's a song about Fallen Timbers. There's a song about uh, Chief Logan. There's uh, songs about tobacco, about torture in Indian times, and about uh, Indian removal across the, the Mississippi. Soon after that, we were approached by uh, a gentleman in Belgium putting together a compilation of folk metal, black metal, ambient metal, and, and so on. Uh, a two-disc set uh, based off, off of this painting, Friedrich. The assignment was create your own song based off of what that painting means to you. And it can be as abstract or concrete as you want. Like, what does that make you feel? And the painting, to me, depicted uh, a man in, in West Virginia overlooking the Ohio River from a mountaintop from his cabin in the Great Depression. And he's raising his kids and wondering where he's going to get money and food. His wife had passed away, and it's a very sorrowful song, but it was I tried to capture what, what was in this painting. So uh, the song ended up being one of our most popular songs ever, actually. And it, it was kind of just a quickly written idea. But the significance of this is, toward the end of it, I said, I, I think I hear some heavy guitars. This sounds like it could be half clean, half metal at the end. And we decided to go for it. And it really helped the song. But it brought metal, metal elements into Nechachwan, my main project here. And starting on the next album, we incorporated that here and there, probably 30% metal and 70% other atmospheric music. And the second album, Azimuth of the Other World, is largely about mound builder culture in West Virginia and Ohio, um, Adena and Hopewell cultures, as well as some other Indian topics. Indian related topics such as a Lakota poem and brings me to the third album here, Oto. This was really exciting for us because it was our first time having a vinyl release and collecting this stuff growing up. It's like, wow, it would be really expensive for somebody to pay to have a record made. So at this point we were on binder and recordings. We had switched labels after the first album and band's been 
amazingly supportive of everything that I want to do. And I still work with them to this day. So we had some songs on the wind. I had some Shawnee lyrics and a song dedicated to an elm tree. It's the largest elm east of the Mississippi River that's in my hometown, and it's, it's quite dead at this point, unfortunately. <laughs> and they're building a bridge almost on top of it. I have a picture of the Hawking Hills region here. We decided to make each half of the record uh, a different feel. The, the first side is all organic acoustic instruments, clean, no metal stuff. And uh, the second side is, is heavy black metal influenced folk metal. This is my favorite recording that I've ever been a part of. This Heart of Akamon. It's also been our best selling. This painting represents uh, Braddock's defeat in the uh, 1750s. We see a young George Washington back here trying to hold up Braddock after he was shot. There's a song on here, The Serpent Tradition. It's been one of our most, pos one of our most popular songs. And uh, it's about a, a prophecy that the Indians would see a, a forked serpent's tongue uh, and, and know that the prophecy's uh, terrible destruction was about to happen. And that took place in the form of the, the flags on the masts of ships that had first come to the east coast of the U.S. And when uh, could have possibly been Shawnees uh, visiting their, their cousins, Virginia or Maryland area, Delmarva area. There's a song that's a dedication to Tecumseh. On the second side, we have some elements of uh, Shawnee uh, religion and uh, lore, history. Traversing the Shades of Death is a, about an event that happened in eastern Pennsylvania. So we have regional and close to regional history and some more spiritual topics on this one. We put out this, uh, The Ancient Pulse. This is a collection of songs that we've done over the last 10 years. It was meant as a 10-year anniversary celebration of songs where we remixed and remastered some works. We have a picture on the cover of Buffalo Creek in Brook County. It's a really significant place to me. And, and then this was our first, first and only seven inch release. Always wanted to put one of these out too. And uh, it's a split release with the band Bleg from Sweden. At this point, we'd also been on a label for European distribution called Nordvis Production in uh, very, very top of Sweden, very far north. And uh, we feel a, a connection in Nordvis's uh, Sami northern Scandinavian heritage and Algonquian American Indian heritage. There's a lot of cross, crossover in the two cultures. And we have a medicine wheel made in northern Sweden here that I requested for this cover. It's like that kind of crosses cultures. And then our most recent is a split release, a split LP with Panopticon. This release, the Panopticon side, is about uh, Austin Lund's son's struggle with, uh, with a heart problem. He's a baby. Possibly the most attractive vinyl that we put out so far. Well, that really shines in that light. The Nachachwan half of this record, uh, we based off of uh, a story. I don't know if it's apocryphal or an actual historical event, but it uh, took place at a place called uh, Standing Rock, not, not the one that we hear about in the news in South Dakota, but uh, near Yellow Creek, or actually in Yellow Creek in uh, Jefferson County, Ohio, just across from where I live in the northern panhandle. And uh, it's about a clash between two tribes in, in ancient times and how that Standing Rock was a place where people would give orations for uh, gener generations. The people would come there as a neutral meeting place to talk about important events. And uh, 
the battle that supposedly happened there is uh, the subject of the first two songs in here. And then I wrote a song called The Mingling Waters that's about uh, Mingo Run next to uh, my, my grandparents' house and property that I still go to from time to time. It feeds into Buffalo Creek. And my idea for that song was probably fictitious, but it, it could have happened. It's just what came to me uh, when I think about that place. Is uh, I've seen archaeological digs there. Uh, you know, within within 50 feet of the property, and, and I know that this was an, an ancient in Indian village uh, at some point in history. And I just picture a burial there of uh, a man that lived there for years and uh, was cremated and his ashes deposited into Mango Run, which flowed into Buffalo Creek, which flowed into the Ohio, down the Mississippi, into uh, the waters of uh, the Gulf of Mexico, back to the place where a lot of those tribes ancestrally came from, from the Yucatan and uh, the Florida Peninsula and such. So uh, a pilgrimage in death, if you will. And uh, we're about 60% through a new record right now that will, again, chronicle a lot of uh, regional places and, and happenings and hope, hope to have that out within, within the next year, hopefully to be done with that. So... In conclusion, I think that uh, if you're going to have a term like Appalachian black metal, that it's more of an ethic than a sound. We don't really have a huge scene, if any. A lot of these projects are, are one person, and uh, maybe a lot of these projects talk to each other and things, but I don't think they're this, there's the same thing as full bands playing in the early death metal scene in Stockholm, Sweden, like Entombed and Dismember and such that had like a, a full-fledged scene. This may be to its benefit in that it doesn't burn itself out, it doesn't become oversaturated, and, you know, it keeps it interesting and not uh, overdone. There are also other ideologies, such as Christianity, we talked about, paganism, um, all different viewpoints, different sounds, ambient soundscapes thrown in, traditional instruments, uh, maybe some elements of rock too, maybe some elements of classical music. But I think that, uh, like me, uh, metal was a great way to express myself when I was growing up. I wasn't into sports or clubs and things like that in school. So maybe people who are into music and musically talented but aren't into country or rap or bluegrass or something, or even if they are, they could incorporate it into metal if they're into that. So my big question is, is that term referring to black metal sounding bands and occult type projects that reside in Appalachia? Or do they sound like black metal, but they incorporate Appalachian cultural elements? I don't know if anybody has a definitive answer to this, but I don't. Um, so is it based more off of the region or the theme that we call it that? So my conclusion that for a lot of these groups, folk, might, folk metal might be a better tag for, for this music. But that's just my own opinion, and people can call it what they want when they listen to it. Thank you again for this experience and for uh, the opportunity to speak about it. Uh, I would say that 35 years ago, it would have been the themes, for sure. And there weren't even that many bands at the, at the time. But now it's absolutely the sound, because there are so many bands that are tagged as black metal that aren't singing about the occult, and their songs might be, I don't know, it might have a little bit of that element. But... Um, that would change from the perspective of person to person. And I'm sure there are chat rooms everywhere that argue about this all day <laughs> over and over about this of this isn't true. This isn't, it isn't cult enough because they're not singing about this or that. And I mean, they kind of have a point when you think about it. If the, the black and black metal is the occult and darkness and evil 
then it seems like that tag should kind of be reserved for those types of bands. That's just my personal opinion. That's why I never used it, not because I don't like the term and not because I don't like true traditional black metal. I've been a huge fan for years, but I'd feel kind of fake with the type of stuff that I write. I think it's more based off of, if I had to pick a word, folk, folk or heritage topics. Heritage metal sounds a little, <laughs> doesn't roll off the tongue really well, but folk metal is just fine with me. You know, ultimately people can call it whatever they want, but that's, that's how I see it. There's not a whole lot from my, my family's end. Um, I used to ask my grand, grandfather all the time, like, why, why don't we talk about this more? And he said, well, when I was growing up, that was the worst thing that you could be. Like, you couldn't be any worse ethnicity than that. So we never talked about it at home, and uh, you didn't tell other people about it. And I think as far as, as far as, if I'm remembering this correctly, you couldn't own land in West Virginia if you were an American Indian until 1965 or so. Might be off by a year or two. Uh, so there was no incentive to explore that part of your heritage. And I think that he felt, my grandfather felt a bit robbed. You know, there were always, always pictures of Indians in the house, but you know, this was like in the 90s and 2000s. It's not like he had to hide anything at that point. But when he was growing up, it was definitely like a taboo thing. And uh, that, uh, that part of my, my family heritage we talked about in my house, but we didn't know a whole lot of details. Now, going back in and researching as far as I could, I, I went back to the 1750s, 1760s, uh, the King family. As far back as I've gone is uh, a man named King John. that was a, a Shawnee uh, a peace chief. And... Um, that established the, the King family, as far as I know. And I, from my research, part of the family went to Missouri in 1830 or 1832, and some of them stayed here in what's now West Virginia and became farmers and blacksmiths and eventually owned land in uh, uh, Wetzel County, what's now Wetzel County. I think it used to be Monongalia County. And uh, gradually moved up the river uh, by the early 1900s to work in power plants. Um, I think uh, Wheeling and then Power and then eventually Wellsburg, Bethany area. And uh, we just keep getting farther and farther away from it. So I've always been fascinated with it and, and tried to, to learn as much as I could from it. And uh, every once in a while, some family member will give me some heirloom. <laughs> it's, wow, wow, I didn't know, didn't know that existed. So uh, I try to be like the family historian of sorts and uh, express that through my music too. It's just always been my thing as, as well as music. Yes, Log Cabin. I've seen this on quite, uh, quite a few. Some of them that I showed here, Twilight Faunus used as panopticons, had the, the cabins. Uh, I think a Twilight Faunus shirt that I have has a cabin on it. So I, I don't know, maybe a, a home place in general. I mean, nothing really captures the, at least the European settler aspect of this region than a log cabin, I would say. There are many native symbols that you could see, but uh, as far as the, the European ancestry, <laughs> That's, what, that's something I see pop up all the time, is the, the log cabin. It seems symbolic. What I hear a lot from people is they'll listen to these extremely harsh recordings, and, and I'm one of these people too, and they'll, they'll hear a type of beauty in it. And so I'm just like, well, is that an insult to the music to say there's beauty? But I do hear a lot of epic, beautiful parts and in, in the harshness of this music. It's really hard to describe the, the personal connection to it. Um, so this music is very hypnotic, repetitive, but not repetitive as an insult, repetitive as a uh, compositional tool to, to get you into a certain 
frame of mind, not always an evil one, but I don't think that, uh, I don't think people necessarily need to be misanthropes themselves or to even follow a, a specific religion or ideology. I think that they can just enjoy it for, for what it is. And uh, some of the music is surprisingly accessible and some of it is surprisingly harsh, but it depends on your, your ears palette of what it likes to hear. But I would think that uh, it could be enjoyed by anybody that kept an, an open mind to it. But the ironic thing is that the, the true cult followers of it don't want that to happen anyway. <laughs> they don't want everyone to listen to it and everyone to check it out and enjoy it. It should be for the, you know, a certain, certain demographic of people to listen to it. Uh, more here than in other scenes, I, I would say maybe there's an element of that in uh, the Cascadian scene uh, because there, a lot of those bands are very environmentally aware. Um, I, I saw m much more of this like in the thrash metal bands in the 80s, Nuclear Assault, Sacred Reich and such that would... Um, it sounds almost almost a bit dated now, but it was you know very very important issue at the time in the the mid to late 80s is uh, nuclear war during the Cold War. What's going to happen when the bomb goes off? We're all going to be dead. And uh, also, I constantly heard about toxic waste in the 80s. you don't hear about toxic waste very much anymore. But a lot of bands had had a lot of that uh, pollution anti pollution theme to them. I think the bands in this region are more apt to write about that now uh, versus 30 some years ago because of things like mountaintop removal or things like actual toxic waste that have heavy metals, no pun intended, that have gone into the streams and given their relatives cancer and their aunt had cancer and their mom had cancer and their grandma had cancer and they're sick of it. and. Uh, where is it coming from? Hundreds of years ago, this is pretty pure land, and Indians weren't getting cancer from the water. What's going on? Who's responsible for that? And while all of that's happening, why are we so poor? If we have to put up with the uh, runoff of industrial profits, who's getting rich from that? We aren't. We're one of the poorest states in the nation. Let's bring some attention to that. And I think that's what why bands are more apt to do that here than in, uh, I don't know, Idaho or somewhere, <laughs> some random random place that's not here. I think uh, it's relevant here. As strange as this might sound, I've never been to Point Pleasant, and that's where my ancestors, my Indian ancestors, were in that area in the 1770s. I uh, migrated from uh, southwest Pennsylvania down into uh, well, Virginia at the time, Mason County. And I've been planning a trip for a long time. I meant to get down there uh, over the spring. And, well, we all had other plans this spring. <laughs> it fell through. I want to see where the Battle of Point Pleasant happened because I had ancestors on both sides. And I've never been to that, that park where it happened. Uh, but I got... Fascinated with uh, Chief Cor Cornstalk's uh, history and story, so I'm writing a song about that right now. Um, this isn't like a like a theme like this has to be on every album or anything, but we've done a song about Chief Logan. We've done a song about Tecumseh. Uh, Cornstalk definitely deserves uh, a song, and uh, we also have uh, a song we're working on about uh, a legend that I heard about a young George Washington surveying out uh, near the Yakagani River, out by the Ohio Pile region, and uh, where he supposedly saw uh, a great horned serpent come out of the yak and grab an animal and drag it down with him. That's Shawnee lure, but as seen by uh, future president, George Washington. So I thought that was an interesting story to write about. <laughs> 